And in the therapy session, it came through, oh, this is secure attachment. This is a feeling of trust in relationship that has been so elusive for me my whole life. No wonder I'm not recognizing it. And wow, now I can like contact it in my body and I can let it spread through my body. I can let different parts of my psyche feel this. Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. If you are ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. My guest today is Ralph De La Rosa. Ralph teaches about two things, the suffering that comes from emotional confusion and the freedom that comes from emotional intelligence. Ralph began practicing meditation in 1996, and he has taught meditation since 2008. He was a student of Amma, the hugging saint, for 16 years. Ralph began studying Buddhism in 2005, and he has combined what he's learned there with what he's learned in IFS, Internal Family Systems. Ralph's work has been featured in The New York Post, CNN, Tricycle, GQ, Women's Health, and many other publications and podcasts. Ralph is the author of two books, both of which I love and I took a lot away from. The first is The Monkey is the Messenger, Meditation and What Your Busy Mind is Trying to Tell You. I particularly appreciate the perspective Ralph offers here that the mind, the monkey, is both an agitator and an ally. It's not something to wish would just go away or just shut up. Instead, the mind actually has some incredible messages of growth and healing for us. If we can put learn to listen. Ralph's second book is called Don't Tell Me to Relax, Emotional Resilience in the Age of Rage, Feels, and Freakouts, a book that's very timely given what is going on in our world and what has happened in the last few years, don't you think? Ralph is a PTSD, depression, and opioid addiction survivor, and their work is inspired by the tremendous transformation they've experienced through meditation, yoga, and therapy. Ralph's work is all about healing, growth, and awakening. We cover so much in this interview. If you're looking to live a better life, if you're looking to understand yourself more fully, if you're looking to make the contribution you would make if only you would get out of your own way. And if you don't already know Ralph and Ralph's work, you will appreciate this interview and their books. So Ralph is offering a course in September of 2022. He offers some other online courses as well. You can learn about those and more on ralphdelarosa.com. With that, I hope you enjoy and benefit from this conversation with my friend, Ralph De La Rosa. Ralph, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad you're here. Ralph, will you tell me, please, what is life about? Ooh, we're just uh, going to hop right into the deep end of the pool here, huh? <laughs> I might ask you who you are next, but, you know, we'll just start from there and go down. <laughs> yeah, let's just get the existential crisis over with you right, <laughs> out the, right out the gate. Yeah, what is life about? I mean, for me, I really think we're here to learn. I really think we're here to grow. I really think we're here to remember our deeper nature. Remember that we're here to take care of each other and that we belong to each other. And I mean, in terms of like the meaning of life, I have a teacher who says the meaning of life is life. Mm. <laughs> the meaning of what happens is what happens. You know, the, it's, it's the richness of our experience that I think we're all, all seeking. And that has everything to do with remembrance and, and learning and growth and all the things I just uh, uh just just danced through so succinctly yeah yeah right on all right well thank you for that i do want to ask you about your relationship with music oh it's been a very important part of your life right big time big time i mean yeah music has really been received and and now really enacted as a form of cultural activism really for for me i mean it's what kept my mind alive in the depths of of hell in adolescence in early adulthood um and being a and having it as a creative outlet as well has really sustained me gave me something to live for 
in the times when there was nothing else, when I had no, no other identity in the world, nothing else that I even knew how to do or cared about doing, um, being able to be in creative process, both with myself and the, the kind of spiritual experience, really, whether one calls it that or not, of, of collaboration, collaborative creative experiences. Mm. One time I played in a, a band that was a, a six-piece ensemble, quite, quite a few of us in that room. And we had played together for so many years that we were able to tap into this like group mind experience where there would be communication within the song in real time between us that we would all be able to pick up on and feel and, and improvise off of and what have you. And that sort of magic is right in line with the sense of magic that I had at six years old mm. when I first started experiencing depressions when I first started um, experiencing trauma um, and I first started having spiritual experiences and, and spirit experiences of just a certain subtle stillness. I couldn't quite put my finger on that. Let me know. This is not it. This is not mm-hmm. it. What, what's going on here and what everybody else thinks is going on here. There's, there's more, there's, gotta, yeah. there's no way this is it. Yeah. <laughs> what was your instrument? Um, so I grew up playing guitar um, from about the time I was 12 and I started writing songs right away at 12 and, um, at 20, I switched to the drums and, um, and drums, I would say are my main instrument now. It it is just, you know, the animal (laughs) in me and animal with regards to the Muppet animal, um, (laughs) really, really, uh, 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 yeah, it gives me an outlet for that level of energy that that I hold. It's such a power instrument. It's such a uh, beautiful and unusual instrument as well to have four limbs and in independent motion. Um, but I recently t- returned to playing guitar and I'm oh. actually working on an EP right now um, of songs about being somebody with neurodivergence and a history of attachment injuries or, or just issues, patterns in, in intimate relationships. And looking for love on dating apps and what, what that's like, you know? Yeah. Um, to, I want to ask you more about that in a moment about the neurodivergence and, and what that means. It's a term I've heard. I'm not familiar with, but before we move on uh, from, from music, uh, I do want to ask you the band that you were in. Was this, was this a punk band? I grew up playing in punk and metal bands. Um, the band I was talking about before that I was in for about five years was more of like a post-punk shoegaze mm. band, which um, correlates to space rock might be a more uh, okay. uh, uh, recognizable term for some folks, just very ethereal, but very like tough and charged at the same time. Wow. Music. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on YouTube after, and I'm going to research this a little further. <laughs> that sounds cool. But that's uh, knowing that your background includes music that way. Uh, you mentioned in your writing, a song that's very different from that. It's Madonna's like a virgin that had a powerful role in your life, whether you liked it or not. But will you talk a little bit about what that song has meant to you or what it's done to you perhaps? Yeah, more done to me. Yeah, it had a torturous role in my mind. But uh, yeah, in the beginning of Monkey as a Messenger, I tell the story of of finding myself in the midst of of trauma and confusion and drug addiction and all of these things, having just strangely enough gone on tour with um, who's known as a, 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 the hugging saint, this guru named Ama. Um, having just traveled across the country with her and I, I somehow landed in the mountains on a dirt road in Colorado with a bunch of healers and, and body workers and energy workers and, and kind of trying out um, a return to devotional yogic practice. And it was, and I had a suitcase worth of belongings and no music with me which was like kind of a big deal at that time to like, to say, okay, no, no, no rock and roll. I'm going to take a break from that entirely for, for a while. And yeah, talk about a pattern interrupt. Right. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And then uh, ha- having had some experience with bhakti yoga in, in an ashram setting earlier on, um, 
uh, where you're in a cold shower at four in the morning and in the temple chanting by 4.30, I kind of tried to recreate that schedule for myself of like kind of this very disciplined, austere, devoted, focused kind of atmosphere of spiritual practice and waking up early in the morning with the sun and first thing in the morning before anything else happens, sitting down, doing some chanting and then getting real quiet with the heart and mind and I've met that moment every single day with like a virgin. <laughs> ooh, ooh, like a vir it would just pop into my head, like just barge in really like no invitation. Definitely wasn't a welcome visitor. And me being like a metal kid, a punk rock kid. And all of a sudden this like cheesy, well, I think cheesy, but a lot of people would say brilliant <laughs> uh, uh, top 40 song from my youth, just, just barging in. And then, <laughs> the fight with it the fight with it like oh god what is this and the f and not having tools not having been exposed to basic mindfulness instructions just yet of like that's just a thought regarded as such return to the breath but just seeing it as an intrusion and and frankly a failure like oh my god i'm here with all this spiritual intention and my mind goes to this 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 what what I would call it pretty trite place. Uh -huh. No, like I'm here with all this substance and my brain is going to all this flimsiness, top 40. <laughs> and just the struggle with that and not knowing what to do with that, not knowing what to do with it. And just, just being tormented by my own mind and, and thinking like it was about the struggle against it. And I'm willing to bet, the last thing I'll say here is uh, I'm willing to bet that my struggle against it, the sense of like, this can't, I, can't, I'm, I, I have this deep, dark secret in my life. It's called being tortured by Madonna <laughs> morning at 5 a.m. <laughs> in, my, in my sadhana. You know, the struggle against it is probably what made it happen every day. It's yeah, held that pattern in place, right? Yeah. That which we resist persists. Exactly. Exactly. You know, how many, how many mornings in a row do you think that happened? I mean, I was there for about three months and so I, I can't tell you, I mean, this is, this is uh, 22 years ago now, but wow. yeah, I will never hear that song the same way again. <laughs> for funny. better or worse. <laughs> That's right. No, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I do want to go back to, to that or to neurodivergence. Sure. What is what does this mean? What does it mean for you? Ooh, I mean, I like how how you're just going right for the depth, right out the gate. <laughs> but, I'm curious. But for me, when I started trying that label on, and I started looking at and taking self assessments for high functioning autism, which it's mm -hmm. very very likely that's that's the category I would fall under, uh, maybe subclinical high functioning uh, autism. But when I started taking self-assessments and I started taking a look back at my experience through that lens, you know, just if this is true about me, then let's take a look at these different formative experiences, well-processed in therapy, but um, it's just started making a lot of things, a lot of uh, things that were nebulous or, or that, there was still a blank spot with makes sense filled in mm -hmm. blanks. Um, it also accounted for not just a lot of experience that I had had in the past that I didn't quite understand despite therapy, like years and years and years of very consistent therapy. Um, it also accounted for these meltdowns that I still have to this day. And this is with a decade and a half of, of very consistent spiritual practice in my life, very consistent therapy, very consistent self-reflection, self-study, the whole shebang. But there is an experience I consistently have of, especially when plans change or it's sometimes it's just random too, that, that I'll just get a piece of information that throws my nervous system into this particular kind of effervescence where I'm overwhelmed and mm. I can't control. I, I lose the ability to control what starts to come out of me and, and, and how um, just, just my words, my behavior, it just, it's, it's a meltdown, right? Like all of a sudden I'm freaking out. People around me are like, what's wrong? Literally nothing happened guy. 
And the best I can do, which I'm, I'm pretty good at these days, is say, I got to take a step back. Mm -hmm. I got I to get off the phone. I got to hang up the call. I got to step out of the situation. I got to go outside. I need to be alone in the other room for five minutes, whatever it is. That's, that's the only real thing I can do with that experience. But it, it just explained away a lot of things. It explained away a lot of things. In fact, uh, when I told some of my family members that um, I think this might be the case with me, um, I was told, oh, we just thought you were so intelligent that you had no common sense. Wow. wow. <laughs> and I, th that, that insight really rocked me. It was, it was hard to receive, but also explained a lot of my experiences with my family, that they just had no idea what creature they had on their hands that I was... Yeah. I was a bit of a feral being <laughs> growing up, but I was also, they wanted to, they wanted to put me in third grade after kindergarten because um, wow. I showed up in kindergarten knowing how to read, um, not even knowing that I knew how to read, but knowing <laughs> how to read and just with a lot of competencies that I shouldn't have had. Um, and things like that just just all of a sudden being able to make sense of your life being able to construe a cogent coherent narrative of your experience is very very much in a line with healing and i could say right. a lot more about that but but uh, it's, it's powerful it's powerful to be able yeah. to do that. Yeah. well thank you for for sharing that um, you know, something reading your books and uh, for anyone listening I've heard this in the intro already but the the books, uh, monkey is the messenger meditation and what your busy mind is trying to tell you. And I love this one. Don't tell me to relax emotional resilience in the age of rage feels and freakouts. It's very timely, <laughs> very timely book now. Yeah. And, and in both of these books, you share very personally from your own experience and learning, but also I think some pretty profound insights mm -hmm. that, that are pointing right to this very thing about, you know, as human beings, we're, necessarily and maybe inescapably meaning making creatures, mm -hmm. but our ability to consciously make the meaning of our lives and shift the relationship we have to our experiences and the events and people in our lives is, is pretty profound. And, um, I, I want to go back because I know that what each of us does mm -hmm. is a function of, or largely a function, maybe entirely a function of what we've lived through, what we've survived. And so your learning and teaching is deeply informed, of course, by your experiences. And you talked about Amma, the hugging saint, and you share a story in the book. I'd love if you'd be willing to talk about, and there's a few, there's a, a few aspects to this because it relates to your addiction, which you touched on in this conversation about an addiction to heroin an addiction to cocaine, being in some very dark places, meeting Amma, this wise sage, a saint, perhaps, mm -hmm who maybe had the power to remove the addiction from your life. Yeah. But you asked her if she would, will you tell us what she said? Yeah. She said, no, <laughs> <laughs> actually. And, and, and the back, the backstory is, is I had been a devotee of hers for years at this point, but had not developed the tools. Buddhism is what really gave me the tools to work with myself and learn how to be a human being. Like, Dude, can you be a human being before you reach for transcendence? You know, mm -hmm. that's actually the formula. And I was just going after transcendence for the longest and it didn't work because transcendence and drugs are very similar. <laughs> and, and, and to my brain, drugs were, you know, kind of the same thing. Um, just another uh, a reach for freedom. And the time came when, uh, the trauma caught up with me and my games and my self-deceit caught up with me and I uh, turned to heroin. And um, that was the deepest pit I could ever imagine finding myself in and trying to get off was this horrendous nightmare. And so, yeah, Amma comes to town, you know, and your teacher comes to town when you're in a, the middle of a nightmare, you go to them and say, can you, can you do something about this for me? Yeah, I know you can and she literally said to me, I mean, this is through translators, of course, I would never do that to you. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm struck by the phrasing to this day. Of, I wouldn't do that to you. 
and that um, she she told me this is this is going to be the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And I would never take that away from you. You're going to have to work. That's it. I don't believe she actually said this, but 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 the sense was you're going to you're going to have to work this uh, out for yourself, and that's going to give you the what you need for the rest of your life. And I had no idea what she meant by that at the time. This is going to be the rest of my life. Oh, great! You mean I'm going to be in recovery from this the rest of my life? I'm going to be like relapsing for the rest of my life? What do you? What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also my re- first reaction was, you know, screw you lady. Like, are you kidding me? I'm your devotee. I'm, you know, and I'm your child basically. And you're going to leave me here. And what a awful pill that was to swallow at the time. You know? Wow. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, reading that in your book, um, it really caused me to think a lot about, you know, the nature of our work and the help we give other people, if there's even such thing as help, whether we're really helping when we help people, you know, this kind of thing. And, and you quote, um, I think it's Lilla Watson that about if you're coming here, I forget it exactly, but you know, if you're coming here because you recognize your liberation is bound up in mine, then let us work together. Yeah. Right. Like, which is a different come from, from like, Oh, let me, let me give you a hand up or a hand out or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, I'm I'm really curious to know what your take is on, you know, helping others because you've spent and you tell these stories in your work about working in the foster system, working with people who are abused, who experience deep trauma, yep. you know, this kind of thing, like some of the worst things that we could imagine. Many of us living in privilege can't imagine. We haven't seen it firsthand in this kind of thing, Yeah, but having lived through and worked with, you know, what you have and continue to, how do you think about helping others well it's it's a great question because you're right it can't be hierarchical me up here you down there it Mm -hmm. has to be horizontal where i i we are on the same path but we are on the same path we are part of the same family and we are in this together and we are also in different roles Mm -hmm. it's kind of especially in the in the teaching role uh, where I have students, this is what I'm always reaching for is I'm learning just as much. Yeah. Okay. And, and here's the nexus. Here's hmm, how to, how to say this. Right? I'm learning just as much as anybody else. It's just the, our lessons are different. And the real crux of the matter really comes down to the genuine experience of compassion. The genuine experience of compassion is the only thing that's going to heal anybody. There's a million expressions. There's a million flavors of compassion. And there's a million different ways compassion can be applied. But any healing that's going to take place necessarily has compassion as a main ingredient in it. Now, when so I think that actually our trauma at a certain level, at a certain level, this isn't the whole story, but at a certain level, is a little bit of a bait and switch in that we think we want to heal our suffering and get away from our suffering, but our suffering is actually here to teach us how to open to genuine, deep compassion in a way that we as hard-headed humans would never bother to do otherwise. Mm-hmm. So in that context, me as the so-called therapist in a room with a so-called client, my job is to be in that compassionate space. And if I'm not in that compassionate space, it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. And so there's an imperative there for me that is very good and teaches me, gives me so much, because that is the doorway. The Buddha literally said compassion is the doorway to ultimate liberation. My therapy client, my students are giving me that opportunity, right? And my job really isn't so much, let me help you figure this out. It's how do I show you how to access that place that I'm in? Right. Because if they're not in compassion with themselves, it's also going to be, I'm not going to say it won't work or there won't be any benefit, but it's going to be a much slower, much more tedious process. Mm -hmm. If I can work on getting somebody into a space of genuine compassion with themselves, their therapeutic process is going to be 
marvelously, ge- generally speaking, very, very efficient and very to the point. And uh, the, the realizations and insights they, they uh, need and desire are going to come about um, in surprising ways. Mm-hmm. So if I'm in a process where I have to be in compassion, you're teaching me to how to be in that space, how to recognize that space, abide in that space. And I'm constantly practicing giving you the roadmap of how to get there yourself. Like the internalization for me is, I mean, it's life-saving, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what you're sharing now, it just reminds me that we are, I have once heard, I don't know, this is truly a Chinese saying, but I've heard there's a Chinese saying that goes, there are no friends, there are no enemies, there are only teachers. Mm -hmm. And in that regard of what you're saying, I'm reminded that we're all, we're always teaching Mm -hmm. everyone, not just through our words and our writing, but through our example, through our behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, you tell a story in the book that I think it's probably not an exaggeration to say it's changed my life about the, uh, the nun who, you know, it's a story. I don't know if it's a parable, you know, with this angry man and the gift. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because that to me is right in line with what you're talking about, about how, and I'll ask you to expound on that if you will in a moment, but I think it's such a beautiful illustration of the idea, the difference, first of all, between kindness and night being kind and being nice, right? Which that distinction also, if you would talk about is pretty profound, but then how this relates back to compassion, because we can do that. We can be powerful, mm-hmm. we can be true to ourselves while having compassion, Yes. Right. But if we're not aware of that possibility, I think we're less likely to do it. But will you, will you talk about these things, maybe about the difference between being kind, being nice about the gift we don't have to receive, like anything related to that? Right. Well, let's go back to this Ama example for a moment. Mm-hmm. Right. Because once she was right, like she, it, the, the work I had to do to recover from heroin addiction, which was arduous, long term, painstaking, painful, total nightmare. <laughs> but also taught me everything mm-hmm. about working with trauma, about the importance of daily practice and having a somewhat thorough and, and oftentimes meticulous checklist of these are the things I do to keep myself okay to, every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, it taught me so much. And, that, and, and just being in the fire with that process for so long really left me with a passion for what I do now that I wouldn't have otherwise. And so she was dead on right. This is going to give you everything for the rest of your life. I'm not going to take that from you. That's compassion. And it was the last thing it was, was nice. In fact, my initial sense of it is this is mean. And I like, I'm (laughs) flabbergasted at your capacity, you know, to just no way, dude, no way. Right. So that's, that's, but that's, that's compassion for you. Compassion has a sense of boundaries. Compassion has a sense of containment. Compassion has a sense of, I think compassion is limitless, but we as human beings have natural limits as well. And compassion, compassionate energy, when we're there, we, I mean, if we want to be true practitioners of compassion, as opposed to codependence, which is a different story, a particular form of nice <laughs> that isn't so good. Um, we have to develop a sense of, you know, sometimes it's okay to leave somebody uh, in dire straits. Sometimes that's what that person needs. Sometimes that's actually an act of compassion to be like, you got to figure this one out for yourself. I can't do it for you. That would rob you of something that you need to get here. Mm. So when it comes to, having boundaries you know so often people what the the struggle with having healthy boundaries and embodying healthy boundaries is around the fear of feeling guilty if i say no i'm going to feel so bad or the fear of where the other person will be left but if you're really situated in compassion there'll be an intuitive sense of no it's okay (laughs) you're you're a grown-ass human you can reach for resources. 
you have an innate capacity to think outside of the box and get creative with this one. And it might be good for you to carve those new neural pathways for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Helping others learn perhaps that they are more capable than they know themselves to be. And it's, uh, I, you point this out in your writing that uh, I think you say something to the effect that fear and guilt are the price we pay for living a meaningful life. Something like that it was like, that is profound. Sometimes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. God, you really read the books. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's, it's true. Um, authentic living means you're going to lose the popularity contest. Sometimes it's that whole a cliche aphorism that I love so much that I am not for everybody, right? It means a, a true living of that phrase. It's okay to let people down. You're not going to like me for, for speaking the truth, for embodying the truth that I hold right now. There, there are times when that is just going to happen. And if we want to be free, that, yeah, that is part of the price of admission sometimes. Yeah. Well, and if you, if you remember this uh, story well enough to share it, would you be willing to talk about this, uh, this nun who came down from her years of <laughs> living in a monastery and sure. I mean, almost immediately the recipient of a gift <laughs> she didn't necessarily want? Uh, full transparency. That's actually a story about the Buddha that I, oh, so, that I elaborated on and I, and I made into a female practitioner just to mess with the paradigm. <laughs> right on. <laughs> and, and um, Beautiful. yeah, yeah. But the essence of the story is, is basically, um, well, I, I, I also elaborated on it to make it a little bit more human because the essence of the story is this, this nun comes down from thinking she's attained enlightenment and, um, and enters the marketplace and just absolutely loses it in the hairiness and the materialism and the scam artists that are present in this open air market and what have you just, just absolutely comes undone. And because the conditions shifted so dramatically from being off in this nice, peaceful monastery. And so her enlightenment comes undone. Right. Like how many of us have had that experience of like, I think I'm really getting somewhere with this spiritual practice. And then, you know, maybe, for example, like Ram Dass says, if you think you're so enlightened to go, go spend a week with your family, you know, go home <laughs> yes. for the holidays. So let's, let's, let's see how that holds up there. Right. Like change the conditions or the Buddha sending students to meditate in haunted places or in the charnel grounds, you know, mm -hmm. like go, go sit next to a funeral pyre and see how your peace holds up there. <laughs> and um, so her enlightenment doesn't hold up in the marketplace. She falls apart and realizes that awakening has to be unconditional. It has to be able to survive in any circumstance, goes back into nature, goes back to the mountain and decides not to go to the monastery, goes and, and meditates with the earth, resituates herself in awakenment and heartfulness, and decides, okay, now I'm ready. Now it's sturdy. Now I feel unshakable, and heads back into town and meets with this person on the road who looks her up and down and just says, oh, you stupid monks, you stupid monastics, I hate you. I hate you. You should, in fact, you're a woman. You should be in the kitchen somewhere. Don't you know your place? You're nothing. You're not contributing to society at all. It's just, just this whole uh, terrible tirade that, frankly, many of us receive on Twitter these days, right? Or might encounter in other arenas of our lives. Right? A lot of vitriol out there in the world. But this time she looks at him and says, excuse me, but Let's say oh, she, first she doesn't react at all, which makes him even angrier. Right? She goes, she, she trolls him, but with, with silence and non-reactivity. Right. And then finally she says, excuse me, let me, let me ask you a question. Let's say, for example, uh, I'm at home and somebody rings my doorbell and <clears throat> they want to come in. And so I say, okay, you can come in. And then once inside my house, they say, they, they hold up a box and they say, this is a gift I have for you. Will you accept this gift? And I tell them, no, thank you. I, I don't accept the gift. You hang on to that. Who does the gift belong to? And the stranger says, well, 
the guest, of course. And she says, exactly. So in this way, you have come into my space and I welcome you. But this gift of anger and hatred you have for me, I decline to accept. It's yours mm-hmm. to keep. And that's one way I've, I've learned to deal with triggering situations. It's not perfect for me. Um, I'll admit that much. Sometimes it takes me a minute to get there. Sometimes I have to pause for quite some time to get there. Hmm. But the animosity of the world, the bullying of the world, the oppression of the world, <clears throat> that's constantly going to be coming at us, right? It's the world. It's broken. It's hurting out there. It's confused out there. But when those energies come our way, one way I think about working with them is, can I take that in and feel it? Because I have to. There's the, the unconscious mind, they say in psychoanalysis, cannot say no. It has no actual boundaries. You're going to feel everything you experience on some level. Mm-hmm. But can, so can I be willing to feel that, but not hold it? Let it pass right through me. Right. Mm. Yes, showing up in your house, but then also leaving. Right. Like almost like your body is translucent and the negative energies of the world hit you, but they just water off a duck's back. You know, that's, yeah. that's, that's one of many ways to contend with such energies. But yeah, that's that's powerful. And that uh, that image, that metaphor of, uh, of a gift also that we don't we don't accept and we don't need to. And you have a sentence. Uh, in your book that says the person coming at you the wrong way is actually suffering and trying to pass their pain on to you. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's just so to me, it's um, such an empowering possibility. First of all, to recognize that and the compassion that becomes available Mm -hmm. of, Oh, they're just hurting and they're trying to diffuse their pain. They're trying to pass it on. It's natural. And second, I don't have to accept it. (laughs) You know, it doesn't make me a bad person. It doesn't make me an a-hole. It's just not my gift. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, somebody uh, I worked with in a therapeutic context once said um, they put a post-it note on their, on their cubicle at work that said, return to sender <laughs> with re- So whenever <laughs> any negative energy or, 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 or just something dysfunctional would come at them, they would just think to themselves, return to sender. I don't accept yeah. it. Don't accept the gift. Don't engage. Right. That's, yeah, that's a great, that's a great reminder. Well, one thing I'm really curious to get your view about as well is, you know, we talk about the, the, um, the insight available, <clears throat> the lessons that can come from our suffering, even from our trauma. And uh, I love the way I heard uh, Eckhart Tolle said this about the fires of suffering become the light of consciousness. Mm. And uh, what I wonder though, and what your take is on, is it possible it's kind of like Ram Dass, right? When he said, when you get the message, hang up the phone. <laughs> Is it possible to get the message without the suffering? Can we somehow cultivate insight and wisdom without having to go through so much hurt? I mean, in this life of infinite possibilities, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's this story in, um, in, I think it's in the holy teaching of Vimala Kirti, this Mahayana scripture, where uh, the Buddha takes um, a, a student to all these different realms to show them how the different realms of existence, and, and this isn't the teaching on the six realms of existence, but just, just different worlds and how things roll out in different worlds and what other lives are like out there and what, how the Dharma manifests in relationship to those conditions. And at one point, there's like a realm of bubbles <laughs> <laughs> and at another point, there's a, a realm of beautiful smells where beings attain enlightenment uh, uh, by smelling beautiful flowers. And, and, and that just gives them this per, per, genuine perception of interdependence and, and, and open-hearted compassion. And, and, the, and the student gets really mad and it's like, why can't we have this as our spiritual practice here on earth? Why? Yeah, we, we're the four noble truths and the eightfold path and sit down and follow your breath and all this discipline and, you know, and working with hardship and obstacles and all of these things. And why can't we just like get off on beautiful flowers, man? <laughs> and the, the, I can't remember exactly what the Buddha's response was, but it was basically like 
yeah, humans on this planet, they're just very stubborn. And this is just what we have to be broken down in order to really start asking the genuine questions. And we need all this discipline and engagement with hardship in order to wake up. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've been comfortable sometimes in my life. And generally speaking, where my mind goes is, well, now how do I just keep it this way? Yeah. I'm i.e. not reaching for anything further, not asking any deeper questions, just how do I make it so that these ducks don't ever fall out of a row again? And invariably they do. And then, I don't know. I, I, but then, I don't know. I think about the, the Bhaktis and maybe the Sufis and some other folks that have like ecstatic experience as part of their spiritual practice. I know for me, that was pure spiritual bypassing back in the day. Mm -hmm. Could others engage in that and have all of the realizations that they need to have to open the heart fully? I mean, I think of Rumi and, and how true that seems to be with regards to their writings, but also how much um how much of Rumi's writings do deal with shadow material? Yeah. As well. So right on. Well, thanks for your thanks for your thoughts on that. Okay, so we've covered a lot, and I do have a few more questions uh before we move on to the enlightening lightning round and questions for you about writing and creativity. But what haven't we talked about that has either been on your mind lately or you think might be of service to people listening? Anything else that I haven't asked you about that you want to talk about? Ooh. I'm working with a very juicy, brand new insight that's come my way. And I'm just starting to talk about it publicly and I'm teaching on it uh, very soon. If you're, cool. if, you're down to, if you're down to hear something on what's called attachment styles. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So those of us who are trauma survivors or didn't have it so wonderful in childhood, didn't have a trustworthy relationship with caregivers um, for whatever reason. And sometimes caregivers are totally trustworthy, but our, a child's experience of them isn't or something goes awry because childhood is deeply complex, right? Uh, we might have what's called attachment issues or attachment injuries, right? Where we mm -hmm. don't experience intimate relationships in adulthood with a sense of security, right? We're either freaked out that they're going to leave us. They're freaked. We're freaked out that they're not the ones for me. We're freaked out about being too much or not enough, or we're freaked out that them being too close to me uh, means I'm going to lose my sense of identity. I'm going to get engulfed. I'm going to lose my sense of freedom, right? Which call. it's totally true. It's totally, <laughs> it's totally true that people experience that and more, right? Like I had somebody who pointed out to me, I'd never, I'd seen it, but I hadn't acknowledged it. That many people will end their relationship, even when it's going well, mm -hmm. out of fear that they'll get left. I'm like, that. there's, it's, oh, yeah. it, there's like no logic to it. And then there's like amazing logic to that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, all I'm going to hurt you before you get a chance to hurt me one. Yeah. I'm anticipating that it's going to go in the future, how it went in the past. And so, yeah. Right. Yep. But so the, that those, these are all examples that would fall in the realm of, of what's called insecure attachment or avoidant attachment, right? Either I'm, I'm preoccupied with the connection in such a way that I'm leaning in so much. And that could be a source of great anxiety, great conflict, all kinds of drama. Um, or I'm leaning back because out of, again, out of fear in some mm. way that, that it's going to mm. be too much. It's going to be overwhelming. I'm going to lose my sense of self. And, and I know many, many people have written and taught about this. Is this largely, is this Piaget? Uh, yes. And, uh, I think Bowlby was, was John Bowlby. Yeah. Was uh, one of the progenitors and, um, yeah, lots of, lots of great thinkers right now. The, the, I would say the like kind of top psychologists that are, are the purveyors of this, of, of putting this into practice would be Sue Johnson, uh, who wrote says, hold, hold me tight. Tight. Yeah. Uh, Stan Tatkin, who uh, wrote Wired for Love and Wired for Dating, kind of the neurological perspective. 
Um, but the point is, is that even if you have those makeups, which I think all trauma survivors do, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the theory is, is that 60% of the population has what's called secure attachment style, an ability to just trust the connection, trust aloneness, trust togetherness. It's all good. And one can bond and, and form relationships with, with a sense of ease and success and, and what have you. Right. And so for those of us who are in the other paradigm, the not secure paradigm, Mm -hmm. there can be a lot of pathologizing, right? Like sense of there's something wrong with me. Um, the conventional thought in psych psychology is you can't get to a secure attachment style. You can't heal these early wounds that you went through because they were too early. They were too pervasive. Um, discovering that sense of ease and trust in relationships, not possible if you've been through enough. Making sense so far? Mm. Yeah, it, absolutely. And I'm, I'm curious, just as you as you proceed, um, I remember reading about this, and I think there was a third, right? Disordered. Isn't there a disorder? Because disordered cause attachment means you have both the insecure and the the avoidant at the same okay. time. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it was my story for a very long time, right? Mm. Which is totally maddening to everyone around you. Right? Yeah. You're pulling them in and attacking them at the exact same in, in the same breath. Mm. But I had this experience recently um, getting close to somebody who had a secure attachment style. And it was kind of uncanny because I had this experience of closeness with them and was empathically attuning to their nervous system. And was struck by this very strange sensation <laughs> that I never had before. And luckily had a therapy session right after that experience where I was able to explore that sensation. What is this? Cause it's not my, it wasn't my feelings about this other person. It was something else that I picked up uh, in their nervous system as somebody who's very empathic. And um and in the therapy session, it came through, oh, this is secure attachment. This is a feeling of trust in relationship that has been so elusive for me my whole life. No wonder I'm not recognizing it. And wow, now I can like contact it in my body and I can let it spread through my body. I can let different parts of my psyche feel this. Huh. How cool to have this sensation because now I can start to organize my nervous system around it a little bit. And as I started to do that, I started and, and just sitting with it in meditation practice, I started to realize this. It's actually the direct sensation of the breath as well. Hmm. That there's secure attachment feels like something very simple, very subtle, very smooth, very supple, very like just like a gentle blanket uh, in wrapped around the nervous system. Not too tight, not too loose, not too heavy, not too light. Just this nice feeling of trust, security. I'm okay. Whatever happens, I know I'm going to be okay. I might freak out for a little while, but I know I'm going to come back to my baseline of relative yeah. okayness. Yeah, even the even the freakouts okay, right? Yeah, yeah. When you when you can trust that you have a baseline, yeah, security, right? Like a baseline of well being. And I started to realize, like this elusive thing that is talked about, it's actually accessible to anybody and it's right there in the sensations of the breath. Sensations wow. of the breath, smooth, simple, reliable, consistent, steady, um, sweet. There's a sweetness to them. And just started relating to my breath as a teacher of secure bonding, a teacher of trustworthy relationship in my life. And just like uh, the, the last few weeks have just been floored. Like, oh my God, the breath has been <laughs> trying to show me this, this whole time. And I'm just now seeing it for the first wow. time because I'm so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are, honestly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but it's, it's, it's really 
the other thing I've been saying to people lately is, you know what liberation means? It means less work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it means life gets easier. <laughs> it means you stop adding all these layers of running around and freaking out to things. And yeah. then you get to reclaim all the vitality that's involved in that. Mm-hmm. And the breath is really trying to show us how to do that in meditation, the direct sensations of the breath in the nostrils, wherever you feel them in the body. If you really listen for it, look for it, there is this like very trustworthy thing that you can start to tap into and begin to relate to and internalize in meditation. That's awesome. That was a very you. complex share, very long way. Oh, so. No, thank you for sharing. There's, yeah, there's a lot in there. Yeah. There. And, um, you know, part of what you're, you're sharing with me, first of all, I'm really happy that you had that experience of, you know, being able to be in relationship with someone that was able, it sounds like in some way to transfer or make possible, make available to you something that was already in you, but then, mm-hmm. you know, there, there it was. Yeah. And I think, I think that's pretty cool. It reminds me uh, a little bit. I interviewed someone you probably know. I saw you had someone in your acknowledgement at Kripalu, mm. but not Steve, you know, Stephen Cope, the author of yoga and the search for cell. I have heard that. I, I know that name. I definitely know that name, but I haven't read uh, their books. Yeah. I, I interviewed him, uh, him a while back and he, in his book, he talks about relationships as containers where healing can be possible. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like, but this is where I learned a little bit about that attachment theory, where if it's, if the person with whom we're in relationship doesn't have that, it's not available to us, but both we can find that and we can be that, or we can provide that. We can discover it together mm-hmm. through something called yeah. co-regulation, right? And there's mm-hmm. lots of co-regulating practices. There's, there's, there's coupled breathing practices you can do. You know, and the, the yeah. canon has lots of this stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. And and then what you're saying about liberation means less work. I love that. In, in your book, I was grateful for the reminder that relaxation isn't something we do, right? It's something when we cease the tension and the trying and the effort and all that, the relaxation is what happens is, is then what we experience. And, and I especially love your metaphor of like keeping corks underwater, mm. you know, which I don't. Uh, I realize that can apply to like many things, but the effort of like trying to manage the aspects of our lives, mm-hmm. like holding corks underwater that eventually <laughs> some of them are going to pop up. Yeah. 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 Especially with regards to emotional repression and, and trying to keep certain parts of us at bay. And so it's just a losing strategy <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, and in, in the long run, it's going to get you, you know? So your upcoming class that you'll be teaching here as we're recording, it's August of 2022. In September of 2022, you'll be offering a new course online. Is it around these ideas or something else? Oh, yeah. Um, these ideas are strewn throughout everything I, I do. But yeah, um, I, I have a full online curriculum at this point um, that starts. will start in September with somatic meditation, just feeling into the body, breathing into the body, really inhabiting the body, kind of like a next level mindfulness practice. Um and then we get into heartfulness, opening up the heart, loving kindness, self-love, uh, using loving kindness meditation for oneself only, as, um, which brings up a lot of different things for folks. And then we get into what is really the core of my life at this point, which is uh, internal family systems therapy and this practice of parts work, working with different parts of yourself in the space of curiosity and compassion as an inroad to healing and transformation. Um which is what I practice in the therapy room with folks, but also something that one can do on oneself. And um, I think the the vehicle of meditation is, is very, um, very conducive towards that. And then, yeah. And then there's, there's more that comes after that, but that's, that's wow. what I'm in September. So that's a lot. That's a lot. It's, it's four and a half months. It's a semester, a very progressive systematic development. Well, I, I realize that probably not everyone is ready for that work, but <laughs> hearing you describe the curriculum for this course, I'm thinking, I wish everyone would take that course. <laughs> you know? Well, you, you don't know? have to be ready to get started either. You know? Yeah, that's right. Good point. Let me ask you, let's see, you were talking, oh, it was about the breath. I just have one thing I learned recently that you were sharing that, I, that I'd love to share with you. Um, Everything. 
you know, these words that we use that um, many, there are many of these, I'm sure that they, we kind of use them in a certain way and we forget the deeper meaning that they have. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I've heard namaste, right. It's something like, what is it? The, the light in me sees a light in you or something like that. Right. But then it's just this hello <laughs> kind of thing. Right. right. Like, I, I recently learned that the word aloha, have you learned the meaning of this word? Doesn't it have like 50 some odd meetings or something? I, I don't know for sure, but a traditional Hawaiian healer recently told me that ha means, so uh, alo, I was told means in the presence of God and that ha means together we breathe. Stop. So like, isn't that amazing? Stop. That is wild. Yeah. It is wild. I, that, this I've never heard. Yeah. So I, I could be wrong. I, I heard it. <laughs> I learned it in Hawaii recently. I was like, that is amazing. Together we breathe in the presence of God. What? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what a greeting that is. Yeah, isn't that cool? <sighs> so I'll never say aloha again, quite so like casually or jo- or ever jokingly, you know. Right. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is funny how that that happens to like people around Amma say Namashivaya as a greeting, which literally means I bow to divine consciousness, but it becomes a thing like, Oh, Namashivaya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting how that, how that happens. Well, that, you know, that just reminds me of something I wanted to ask you about as well. Um, you talk about, I think you call it original pain and carbon and a carbon copy. Mm-hmm. And the reason this is coming up for me is again, like there's a surface level of something like the carbon copy, but then to really heal it or transform it to get to the original pain. And I know that's like, I just went (laughs) maybe a left, a hard left, but I wonder if you'd be willing to talk about this because a lot of our conversation has been about healing already. Yeah. I might not even have those terms, right. But is that, will you talk about this or anything that's coming up for you as I ask this poorly worded question? Sure. Sure. Of course. I mean, we're in the realm of how trauma works really. Mm -hmm. We're in the realm of what Freud called repetition compulsion or more colloquially, the, the things that just come back around over and over again in our lives that drive us bananas, right? The same anxiety, the same depressive cycle, the same uh, dating a brand new person that I thought wasn't at all like the last person I dated, but here we are with the same issues, you know, the same um, addictions and compulsive behaviors coming back around and around again and again, right? That would be the what I would identify as the carbon copy in that analogy, right? That it's a pattern that has its epicenter somewhere in the past. Because what we know about the human nervous system in trauma is the trauma loosely defined as any adverse experience we've had where our defenses were mobilized and rendered useless, right? So that could be as significant as a real situation of assault or abuse, I could also be getting a very gaslighty text message from somebody and ending up in a, in a dialogue that goes nowhere, you know, with, with somebody who's just egging you on and just wants to see you get riled up. Right. And you the, the neurochemicals are mobilized, but have nowhere to go at the end of the day. Right. And of course there's, this exists on a spectrum, obviously assault, not the same as a gaslighty text message, but nonetheless, our bodies are going to, because of the imperative of survival uh, that our nervous system is oriented around, is going to hang on to these experiences because there's lessons in there. And Mm -hmm. the natural propensity is to repeat those lessons over and over again, repeat those patterns, repeat, um, uh, yeah, the patterning that that creates in our nervous systems. And that's one, so that we remember but two, you know, remember for survival's sake, but two, because our bodies really actually don't want to hang on to painful experiences. Like what, what organism, you know, from a Darwinian perspective would <laughs> hang on to painful experiences that hold them back in some way. Um, that's actually a liability. That's not going to bolster your son, your ability to survive. Um, ultimately, Our bodies want to heal. They don't want to hang on to what we internalize as painful experiences. And so I think the repetitions, the carbon copies of these experiences we we, uh, have in our lives 
of the same patterns coming back around and around and around. Have that purpose of, of you know, when, when we're triggered in some way, that the energy of that original wound that's being triggered, you know, somebody, you know, like I, for example, my dad walked out on my family when I was four, we just came home, his stuff was gone and a deeply confusing, deeply painful for me. Uh, five, six years ago, I had a partner who did the exact same thing, Wow! came home and her things are gone. What? Like, how did you not tell me? Like I had like no warning, um, and the emotions that came up for me then were, and this is a very direct one-to-one kind of example. Sometimes it's much more mysterious, uh, the connection between original pain and carbon copy pain, but the emotions that came up for me then were yes about the situation, but had the energy of that past situation, which means healing is possible. Mm-hmm. healing the original pain is possible when the uh, uh, when a wound is exposed and only when a wound is exposed can it be healed I, I think I'm coming at this in a convoluted way so is this making well no, what you're saying I mean again I realize this is somewhat of a somewhat of an abstract concept but potentially a very powerful one right this idea that we and this might not be exactly what you're saying but I've heard something to this effect before that we unconsciously will engineer situations like we'll repeat things. But the reason we're doing that is so we can heal (laughs) something that happened. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of that, uh, what's that Jung saying, right? Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate Mm -hmm. kind of thing. But it's like, here's the opportunity to understand why I'm eating compulsively or why I can't stop scrolling Facebook or, you know, why I'm procrastinating on this or gambling or online porn or whatever it is, yeah. whatever form or flavor that takes for us. But the idea, instead of going, well, I'm just a screw up or there's something wrong with me, which maybe that's true, but I don't think so. And it's not very empowering. Instead saying, no, you're actually trying to complete something. Right. There's some original wound. And if you will look back and you will actually feel, you will allow yourself to feel the pain of that, then you will no longer need to continue this self-defeating pattern in the present and keep feeling this, this level of pain. Thank you so much for saying that way better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, re- I'm reminded of this, reading a lot of this in your book. And I just, and that's why I asked now this idea of the original pain versus the carbon copy. It's like, man, that's profound, but we've got to go past the surface level of the carbon. Right. That original. Yeah, indeed. And, 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 but literally when, when we are triggered, it is either an opportunity for a re-traumatization or it is an opportunity for healing and transformation and the, the kind of railroad switch, right? If you imagine a railroad switch that determines whether the train goes in this way or that way is Mm -hmm. passion. If compassion is in the situation, either coming from outside from another person or coming from inside, from yourself towards yourself, which is what this parts work thing that I practice is really about is how do we, how do we get a direct, genuine experience of that? But if compassion is present in the moment of these calcified emotions being made liquid, we can say again, by a situation, old, old pain being triggered by a current situation, I have compassion in this presence. We're going to move in a very good direction. But it's scary. It can be scary, right? <laughs> I mean, sometimes in a class context, I'll, I'll, I'll have people just stop and imagine a fully healed life, a fully healed life. It's like, I don't even know what that would look like. I don't even know how to imagine that. Yeah, exactly. And then I'll ask, I'll ask for a show of hands, like who's terrified right now? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, the only good life. Do I have six pack abs? I don't know yet. <laughs> You're like, what am I driving in that life? I don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, do I have a bedtime in that life? You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Who can, who can imagine such a paradigm after you are so habituated to trouble and pain? Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for writing about this and thank you for talking about it now. I hope, I mean, it's been useful for me and I suspect and hope that for people listening, it will be as well. But then there's also this thing about, okay, so I have some awareness of this and there's so much more that we could talk about, 
that, that I won't ask you about right now, but I just encourage people to check out your site, read your books, but the things you talk about model scenes, the thing you're touching on now, the in, internal family systems. So where I'm going with all this is if people hear this and there's something resonating with them, they want to know more. And of course, we've talked about your course coming up in September. Many people listening will have missed that, but what would you suggest people do? How can they, how can they work this out for themselves? We often can't do it on our own. I think it seems, but where would you point them or what would you suggest to them? Yeah. I mean, like the best way to learn guitar or piano or how to do rock climbing or snowboarding is to get a lesson from another person, you know? So in, engage with a teacher of some sort or a practitioner of some sort um, is, is generally very advisable. It's one thing to learn meditation on an app, but it's another thing to in, engage meditation in the presence of a community and somebody who is a, a trustworthy guide. Um, so connect, connect with others. Um, I, I think, I think daily practice of meditation is incomparable, invaluable. There's no substitute for it. Um, if you work on nothing else, um, working on that would be, um, something that is going to provide dividends uh in due time you know if you're only working on one thing uh, if you only have space in your life to work on one thing i would say work on that because everything we're talking about is our inner world everything the pains we we hold the, the patterns we repeat these matters of awakening matters of the heart and so on it's all the inner life and uh, which is so deeply underprivileged and under nourished in our society and so um work on your inner life Work on your inner life. And, and, and I don't know of another way to really do that except to yeah. stop, sit your butt down and close your eyes and go inside, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. So with your permission, I'm going to go ahead and transition us to the enlightening lightning round. It's a series of questions on a variety of topics. It's 10 questions. All right. Uh, my aim for the most part is to ask the question and stand aside. I might tug on some of your answers here or there, but. Uh, for the most part, I'm going to try to keep us moving through this. All right. I'm nervous. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm on a game show. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I love games. I love, I love games. Okay. All right. Question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a exploding train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> of beautiful possibilities. Okay. I love it. I'm going to go Thank with that exploding train wreck of beautiful possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Question number two is what is something about which you have changed your mind in recent years? This is hard to say because it's not simple, but I'm going to just put it out there. And if you want more, you can ask for more, but <laughs> okay. That those around us who hold views we consider to be dehumanizing and even a threat to our own survival are worthy of compassion. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Question number three, if you were required to wear a t-shirt every day for the rest of your life, I had a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip on the shirt, what would it say? It would say, is your heart open or closed? Mm. Okay. Question number four, what book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? Be Here Now by Ram Dass, hands down. Mm. That, is a, that is a book I'm constantly buying multiple copies of to give to people. Yeah. Yeah. It's where it all started for me. That's yeah. It's beautiful. Started. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, question number five, you travel a lot. What's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable. This is going to rhyme because it's not a hack, but my <laughs> aunt is snacks. <laughs> it's, a snack. it's very important. Traveling. It's hard to stay well nourished when traveling. Yeah. And hydrated. I'm not a light traveler. I bring enormous amount of supplements with me. Yeah. Hydration tablets, the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. 
right on. Well, and that reminds me, and I do appreciate this. Um, I, I forget which of your books this was in, but you talk about how to have difficult conversation effectively, right? And I appreciate that you give the little acronym HALT, right? Of when not to have a difficult conversation mm. and the H standing for when you're hungry. <laughs> so it's no surprise to me that you take snacks with you. You're walking your talk. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Not the time to engage difficult conversations. Yeah. Smart. Okay. Uh, question number six, what's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Uh, cardiovascular exercise on the regular time was, I thought yoga just asana practice would be everything and running, cycling, strength training, like getting the heart rate all the way up on the mm. regular. So important. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Question number seven. What's one thing you wish every American knew? Or maybe I should say every United States citizen. That behind the eyes of other people is an entire life of experience, a heart full of dreams and nightmares and anxieties that are not unlike one's own. Mm. Me too. Thank you. Okay. Question number eight. What's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? Listen without waiting to talk. Mm. Just take someone in, formulate your response after you're, after they're done, not during. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. And question number nine, aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money? <laughs> um, I laugh so heartily because I have been dirt poor my entire life until a couple of years ago, and I'm still getting my head around how to how, how that works at all. Um, but you know what? Like my guiding principle in life that has served me so well and is the reason why I'm here and is strangely enough the reason why I have any money to my name at all um, is generosity. And I think it's an important thing that as you're taking it in, if there's surplus, have a vehicle for it to be going back out to other people. Mutual aid funds are great. Uh, social justice orgs, the ACLU, great. Doctors Without Borders is great. Your friends that you know are going through difficult things, you know, great. Buying somebody a cup of coffee on Venmo lights me up every time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I'm know sure. about them, but I get a hit. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Um, I told you there were 10 questions. There were really nine, but uh, speaking of money, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know here that in an effort to express my gratitude to you for sharing generously of your knowledge, your wisdom, your experience, uh, both in your writing and in this podcast today, I have done two things. I've made a hundred dollar micro loan hmm. through Akiva.org on your behalf to a woman in Rwanda named Joyus. She will use this money to, it'll be part of a loan that's crowdsourced where she will buy a delivery van where she'll be able to deliver water to customers who don't, who didn't previously have clean drinking water. So that's one way. I hope that this conversation will do some good in the world beyond just whoever might hear it. Amazing. How yeah. old are you? That's, that's pretty cool. Isn't it? I, I, I do. I do. I like to do that for each, each of my guests. And then, and the other thing I did, which I don't do for each of my guests, um, I made a hundred dollar donation to the Utah pride center, uh, specifically oriented toward mental health issues. So I did that. Um, Very nice. thank you. With you in mind. So thank you for giving me a reason to do that. Yeah. And well, your name is brilliant. So <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Great. Well, cool. Well, this brings us to the, the last part of our interview. And as I said before, there really is so much more. Maybe we'll do a part two 
sometime. Sure. But sure. Um, what I'd love to ask you about now is just a few a few questions about writing, the creative process, maybe about publishing and marketing, yeah. things you've learned that could help others on on their journey. Yeah. Um, but let me start with this question: When did you first know you were a writer? I loved writing growing up, but it was journaling and it was very abstract, but I loved it. I made some zines, like punk rock zines, like photocopied DIY political outlet for rage and radical feminism zines in my teen years. But that wasn't real writing. It really hit me that I had a gift with it and it could go somewhere. Uh, When I was a sophomore and undergrad at the age of 30, taking an autobiography class, a memoir class, and had to put together a pretty, pretty big body of work to graduate that class. And, and toward the end of that class, um, really felt some wind beneath my wings um, with writing and, and th- thought, okay, you know what, maybe, maybe I want to write a book someday. I don't know, maybe yeah. in like my twilight, so that's what I'll do. Yeah. Where did you, where did you go to school? I started at Burroughs Manhattan Community College and I graduated from Fordham University. Oh, Fordham. Right on. And what, tell me again, if you will, you, did you study psychology? Was that uh, your degree? Yeah. I was, I, my degrees are in social work. Social work. Okay. Yeah. Right on. So, so with your, um, let me ask you this with that class, maybe that, that teacher, and I suspect there, there might've been others, but who has been influential in your development as a writer and what have you learned from them? Hmm. I think, I think it was one of my clinical professors in, um, grad school, uh, Rachel Kammer was her name. Um, was the first person who said to me, you know, you have a really strong voice. You know, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, well, yeah, maybe in my twilight years. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but but she said, no, I really think you could do something with this now. And that was the first time um, somebody believed in me um, in with regards to this particular talent. Um, and, and expressed it um, independent of, of me really doing anything other than turning in some papers. And that was pretty huge. And then really good writers, you know, watching um, writers like, like Susan Piver and Lodra Rinsler and uh, my friend Adriana Limbaugh, um, watching other people who are meditation teachers just out there doing their thing in the world, piece together on their own books of profound thought, profound teachings, and really touching thousands and thousands of lives. I would also say just indirectly huge inspiration in in my life. Uh, My friend Amanda Gilbert is another one that like her, her book just blew me away with its depth given that she's such a lighthearted being to, to know personally. And then she comes out with this book that just has all these layers of, of depth and meaning that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not familiar with, with Amanda's work. What is, um, I'm looking her up on Amazon right now. Amanda Gilbert. Yeah. What's, um, what's the book that, is it kindness now? Yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. Really great book. Right on. That's great. Tell me what's the, um, what's the hardest part for you? I mean, you've done something that many people aspire to do, which is publish uh, a couple books and not just a couple books, but good books, books that I suspect are making a difference for many people. I, I would bet that you're now getting letters from people that you've never met oh, yeah. <laughs> telling you yeah. how your books have impacted them. Yeah. But, and, and I want to come back and explore that a little more, but, but what I want to ask is, like how, how, like, what is the hardest part of that for you? What was the hardest part of getting these books drafted, getting them published? And how did you manage to overcome those difficulties? The vulnerability, honestly, which is the driver of a lot of things, such as resistance, procrastination, writer's block, um, uh, uh, churning out writing that isn't so good or, or, or from the bones. Um <clears throat> 
Yeah, vulnerability, the, the the sense of exposure. It's I mean, it's it's such a complex thing. It, it has a it's a beast with a lot of arms to it, right? The because the, there's the vulnerability of being seen, the vulnerability of trying, the vulnerability of trying and, and possibly failing, the vulnerability of somewhere in the background of your mind, you know that if I become a public figure, that's going to expose me to a tremendous amount of critique. Um, Brene Brown says that um, publishing a book is like stripping off all of your clothes and walking out on a stage naked and saying to the auditorium, so what do you all think? <laughs> so there's that level of like emotional exposure as well, um, where you're really opening yourself up to humiliation, potentially scathing Amazon reviews are <laughs> just come with the territory. Um, yeah. And, and then, and then that, being such a, a again a beast in the background of your mind that that I really feel like that's what accounts for the pervasive sense of procrastination and and resistance to the process. Completing my first book, I realized, oh, writing all writing a book is is it's it's just a lot of writing. It's just a lot of the days in front of the laptop where you're just doing the dang thing. That's really what it comes down to in, in a way. It's math. It's arithmetic, right? <laughs> you know, a lot of one plus ones, and then you're, you get somewhere at some point. Yeah. I, I had one guest who described it as like building a wall where, you know, maybe the words are bricks and you're just, yeah. and before you know it, if you keep at it, <laughs> you produce yeah. something. Exactly. Exactly. But it's, it's, it's tough. It's, it's not easy to, sign up voluntarily to put your heart on the line like that. So what, how did you resource within yourself or how, what, what allowed you, or how did you, how did you persist? How did you, for lack of, like, hopefully not sounding cheesy, but how did you triumph <laughs> against this, this challenge? Well, let's be real deadlines <laughs> yeah. are an enormous boost when it just has to get done. And somebody's cut you, you know, a small but significant check that you will have to pay back if you don't get it done. Yeah. Mm, leverage right there. There's yeah. that, you know, that that it does kick you in the butt. But then also this might be really useful to some folks is, is figuring out um, what my personal reward system looks like. Mm -hmm. Right. So I have a friend who wrote a book and made their deadlines by writing a bunch of checks to the NRA and giving them to a friend. And saying, hey, listen, if I don't have this word count on this date, you send one of those checks. <laughs> if I don't have this word count on this date, you send another check like that. And that person did not miss any deadlines because they didn't want any money going to the NRA. That would never work for me. That would never, ever work for me. But I have another friend who, who uh, you know, had milestones and like an Amazon shopping cart of like, at uh, 10,000 words, I get that pretty dress. And at, mm -hmm. <laughs> at 20,000 words, I get that, you know, that other thing that I want. And that would never work for me either. I would just cash out the cart at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what works for me is being rewarded during. Mm. Being rewarded during the effort. So like if I am under deadline and it's Sunday and it's my day off, but I'm going to put in three, four or five, six hours of writing today. I'm going to do that at a really nice dinner. Mm. I'm going to sit myself down and, and have a bit of a treat yourself moment and do the work while I'm enjoying that. And that helps me tap into some inspiration and gives me a little bit of fuel and, and a sense of not being such a, uh, it not being such a grind. Yeah. 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 What I, what I love in that is this is one of the challenges of writing, I think is finding what works for us and what doesn't mm -hmm. and using what works. And even when we find something that works, it might run its course and we need to find something new, mm -hmm. you know, but, but my experience and also my questions for, for uh, about 150 other authors have, have led me to, to believe that the way we organize our time and our space matters tremendously as well. Mm -hmm. what worked for you? What habits and routines, what systems and environment did you, I know that's a big question, Ooh. but what's, what's been supportive for you in actually producing finished work? Two, two levels, big picture, small picture. Um, and really good question, by the way, but um, the big picture was 
as I was teaching and, and teaching more and more uh, back in the Brooklyn days, I had a sense of I am developing something here and I don't know what it is, but mm. I, I, this is going to pay off that I have all of these class notes in my Google Docs and therefore never teach the same class twice. Always make a new batch of notes for the way. If it's the same workshop I've given six times, we're coming at it differently this way. Those notes are going to be rearranged. I'm going to put new quotes and different things in there. Always be like pushing that envelope at least a little bit every time you sit down to open your mouth in front of people. Um, and that paid off in that both of my books, I wrote stream of consciousness. There was no research. There was no there was very little like Google searching to find out this or fill in this blank. It was actually right there in my body already. And I was really amazed by that, but I had been teaching for like a decade at that point. And I, I, I just had it in me in this particular way that I was like, holy crap, this is just like pouring out of me wow. um, because I had, had done background work with this sense of this is going to need to go into whether it's a training manual later or a book or something else. Um, and then smaller picture would be on the day to day. Like there's the reward piece, but really what we're in the realm of is how does your muse work? How, mm. what's your relationship to that um, mysterious thing that goes on with creativity? Right. And um, one, one thing about the way the muse works for me is I really relate to Johnny Cash, who said, I'm not the maker, but the deliverer of music. I really relate mm -hmm. to Neil Young, who said, um, ideas are written on the air. And if you happen to get your hands on one, I'm paraphrasing, but if you happen to get your hands on one, you better drop what you're doing and nourish that. This is in Elizabeth Gilbert's work, Big Magic, as well, that ideas oh, don't yes. belong to us. They visit us and they they check us out. Are you going to be the one for me? Are you going to take care of me? Are you going to nourish this vision? Are you going to, you know? And so, you know, I really, I'm annoying to hang out with because if I get an idea and it's one that just hits me in a particular way, whatever I'm doing, I'm out to dinner with somebody at a show, walking down the street, wh wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, I'm so sorry. Can you give me a moment? And I'm like turning around and voice dictating into my phone and get until I get the whole thing. And, and I've had that turn out to be like hours, <laughs> but wow. if an idea visits you, if inspiration visits you, you know, you got to be devoted to it because you, you yeah. know, it's, it's not necessarily going to come back. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's powerful too. And that idea that you know, there are, there is this thing about doing, like you were saying hours in front of a, a keyboard or with a word processor or however we write longhand, if it's, that's it, if that's our thing, but there's also the aspect of being a receiver, so to speak, like attuning ourselves to, to listen, heeding it once we hear it, if we're lucky enough to do it. Mm -hmm. And then there's all the work of organizing too. So I'm curious when you say that your books were written, um, basically stream of consciousness, how much outlining was involved and how much of a sense of this is the reader I'm writing for. This is what result I want the book to have. Like, was there much of that at all? Or what was that like? Mm, there was less of that than my publishing company would like there, <laughs> would like for there to be. Um, I really, I, I consider inspiration to be one of my main teachers in this life and, and just obeying inspiration and following intuition. Um, I've always had a sense that the people I'm here to speak to are the people who probably say I'm not into religion, but I'm spiritual. And if I had to pick one, it'd probably be Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, I would just have that sense of people who are sitting and interested in contemplative life. But, you know, if I give them too much of the trappings <laughs> of, of some sort of formality, um, they're going to run. So, which is great because then I can keep things very grounded and, and street level. Um, but no, not, not a lot of outlining. In fact, Don't Tell Me to Relax was written in two months um, because Shambhala Publications actually came to me and said, hey, listen, we're figuring out that this election, 2020 presidential election thing is going to be a huge disruption for contemplative people and they're going to be hungry for resources that aren't about acceptance and we think you might be the person to have the voice to speak to this 
And after some negotiating back and forth about what, what forms that would take and how political we wanted to get, uh, once we finally were at the clear yes for us both, it was like, okay, well, we've got to really step on the gas now and get this thing done. And, um, and so I took two months off of seeing clients and just sat down and, and wrote every single day wow. and handed my editor a huge mess. <laughs> <laughs> he, Matt Zeppelin is, is his name. And I owe him a debt of gratitude beyond it beyond because he took that mess and, and was able to uh, formulate it into something that made some sense. And then we went into a more collaborative revision process from there. Wow. To print the week that COVID lockdowns began. Holy cow. Not, not knowing what was coming at all like that, that book would take on a particular relevance beyond just the presidential election of that year. Um, still, I wish it wasn't so relevant right now, but it frankly yeah. is. It is for sure. Tell me about the titles. What were the working titles for these? How did the how did the titles that they have now become what they are? What are your thoughts generally about titles? I mean, one, as you can tell, I'm a long-winded person. <laughs> that is also much to my publisher's chagrin. Um, but The Monkey is a Messenger hit me in meditation, actually. And I cried that day. Um, I, I wept because the, the bones of that book were formula, forming in me before I ever talked to a publishing company at all. Um, and when that title hit me, because I really wanted to write a book that contended with the reality of overthinking from a self-love perspective, it's like stop demonizing this as bad, y'all. It's like that's antithetical to the whole thing. What do you talking about um we need to get rid of this part of ourselves or it's just fluff everything about us is meaningful we need to love this aspect of ourselves and it hit me through formulating this book uh uh in my mind like these thoughts are actually trying to tell me something and they're actually and the message might be a little bit coded and so, and then the monkey as a messenger hit me in meditation one day and I just wept like, that's beautiful. Wow. Uh, life is really speaking to me with this one. Don't tell me to relax was more me just being a bit pissed off myself <laughs> and, um, and wanting to put something out there that spoke to meditation from a radical feminist perspective and also said to people and particularly cis women and, and, and trans folks uh, 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 said, communicated like right, we're, we're, we're coming at the marginalized experience here, you know, and, and who gets, who gets told to relax. It's usually women, right? cis yeah. women in particular, but also other people who are upset about oppression and it's um, it's BS that happens. And it, it's, it's never worked for one person even once that they're told to relax and okay, do your thing, yeah. buddy, you know? Yeah. So I wanted to convey that, that it was a book about meditation where we weren't going to, we were going to talk about being activated and that being activated in certain circumstances is actually not antithetical to compassion or even peace. Yeah. So were those, were the titles, it's obviously, um, monkey is a messenger. As you said, it came, came to you in meditation. Um, you had that, but with don't tell me to relax. Like, did you have that early? Was that, you know, even in the formative files, was that what you were saving things as, or did that emerge later in the process? How did that, what was the timing like on that? In the process so there was, um, I mean, once, once you're working with a, a publishing company, they actually will generally have the last say mm -hmm. in the title. They want it to be your title. And you, they want it to be something you feel good about. But ultimately, excuse me, ultimately, the publishing company has a huge say in it, a title, uh, 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 cover art, et cetera. They have a huge say in it. 
They want you to be happy with it though. Um, and so that one was one where we were in such a, I want to say a rush, but we were being brisk in our process. We had a huge back and forth and it, we, it went through many iterations when, and I had a long list of potential titles and that was actually not a strong contender. And then one day my editor came to, to me and just said, we actually think that this one, this one pushes a button. This one actually says a lot about what this book is going to be. I think our, our first title was like all the feels or something like that. And, and um, yeah, we went with that one because there was some, there was a lot of heat behind it like Yeah, it about meditation that says, don't tell me to relax. Like what? <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's great. I realized that um, being a teacher, being a communicator is often a very different skill set from being a marketer, being a salesperson, being a promoter, you know, that kind of thing. Not but according what, to Instagram. <laughs> that's right. It's, <laughs> that's right. What have you learned in your time as an author about marketing and promoting books? I mean, I'm the last person to ask because I really, I don't do anything that feels gross ever um, as a rule. And my social media following suffers because of it. My newsletter numbers suffer because of it. And I just don't care. Um, I think authenticity is what this world needs. I think um, people who are a little bit anti-platform is what the marketplace actually needs. Um, and I just, I, I, I think it's really disgusting that we've been reduced to commercials online. Um, they've got everybody else to be a commercial unto themselves. That way we notice less when they insert the actual commercials. And the whole thing is like de us dehumanizing ourselves in service of them being able to deliver commercials more seamlessly. And that is deeply disgusting. So, um, I, I really think, first of all, I didn't plan on ever getting this big. I didn't, this is like wild to me that I'm here. And I, the re only reason why I'm not a broke social worker working with kids in Harlem, which I plan to do for my entire life, um, is because of that, that kind of fierce sense of integrity with it, of like, this belongs to everybody. I am not going to play any of your capitalist games. And I'm going to like really shoot from the hip and come from the heart um, mm -hmm. with this thing. And I, somehow that's what, what got me scouted by multiple publishing companies and scouted by retreat centers and all these big name venues is, is that, um, degree of heartfulness and so i don't know that's awesome that's going to be my answer is <laughs> i love it no thank you torpedoes live live your love you know yeah well I, th I think it's great and i think it's good for creatives to hear you know because what works for one person might not work for them but to hear people talk honestly about their experience i think is it's almost always useful so yeah and, it and then what you're saying resonates with me as well yeah. I'm the same way. And then on, like, I think about this a lot because on the one hand you have people like peace pilgrim, you know, I read a book about her years ago yeah, where she talked about selling spiritual, like teachings is something one should not do. <laughs> and then on the other end are people like Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. who I think Tony is also an incredible spiritual teacher, mm -hmm. even though he talks about a lot of things and he charges a lot of money. <laughs> so you know, again, it's, there's not a one size fits all, but we each get to figure it out for ourselves. Well, I'll just say this, you know, and one, I love that you read Peace Pilgrim. That's what a amazing, amazing being that was. And um, two, I do, the one thing that I point to in marketing that I do try to emulate is actually, if you pay attention to Apple's marketing, all they, all they do is they show you the product, right? And an ad for an iPhone is just the freaking iPhone. Yeah, that's it. And you already yeah. know what it is. And so that's the one thing where I'm like, okay, that I can do. I can show you what you're getting and what you're getting is me talking and writing. And so that's, that's my social media is me talking and writing. And I just look at it that way, you know, without yeah. too much of a, a plan around it. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. And at the same time too, like I think about a, a few years ago, I read um, Edgar Casey. 
Mm. I read his biography. You know that guy? Mm. Exactly. That's the point, right? Like he's an amazing healer. Like in the forties, he would do remote sessions. He would go into these internal States and people would write him letters about ailments they had, and he would make an appointment with them. Mm. And then he would see things about whatever their illness was. And then he would write him back a letter, okay. but he never wanted to create a movement. He never wanted to have an ism, never wanted to have like a school about his stuff. And I'm like, that is amazing. So Anyway, it's, um, yeah, what you're saying, like I said, it resonates with me. Okay. So we're just about at the end of our time. And again, we've talked about so much and there's still so much more we could discuss, but <laughs> I will ask you two final questions. One is about this writing and creativity. And then there is more general, uh, about what we want to leave, what you want to leave listeners with, whether it's a request, you know, an invitation, a thought, an inspiration, whatever. But the first is what advice or encouragement? would you leave those listening with that might help them complete their own creative projects, make the difference in the world that they're capable of making by sharing their message and their writing. Keep going. Just keep going. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep your head down. As Chuck Close says, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. Yes, you need the inspiration, you need the muse, but at some point, all that writing is, all that making a song is, all that making a record is, all that making a podcast is, all all that making a spiritual practice is, is you just do the dang thing and you keep doing it and you keep doing it and you just don't give up. That's really what it comes down to. That's the basic arithmetic. Awesome. And I realized that when this, I think it's so good. That could be the final thought. No pressure here, but if there is a final thought or final ask anything for people listening as we go ahead and wrap up, what, what is it? I have a new working definition of enlightenment. Would you like to hear it? <laughs> Absolutely. It is the full reclamation of the best of our childlike qualities. Not childish, childlike. Right. Spontaneity, play, innocence, wholesomeness, uh, uninhibitedness, uh, expression, liveliness, vitality. Generosity. Generosity, right. Yeah. Those so the qualities. full reclamation of our, so the definition of enlightenment is the full reclamation of our childlike qualities. Within the context of full maturation. So mm. Wisdom, insight, discernment, ethics, tenacity, uh, healthy habits, healthy community supports, career, financial intelligence, right? Like the best of both worlds, right? Imagine that life, all the, all the inspiration and wildness and freedom of childlikeness, but within this like really healthy container of maturation. Wow. That's cool. And you know what, that well, part of what I love about that is that that seems doable to me. Yeah. Right. And then that for me is like the catalyzing question on a fully healed life. That earlier thing that I'm like, I don't even know what that would look like. But now when you describe it this way, like I start to get a sense of what that might look like for me. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thank that you. Resonates. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, uh, my guest today, Ralph De La Rosa, author of Don't Tell Me to Relax, Emotional Resilience in the Age of Rage, Feels, and Freakouts. And monkey is the messenger of meditation and what your busy mind is trying to tell you. I do hope, especially if you've listened this far, if you haven't read these books already, you read them and you share them and you make the difference in the world that you are, po it's possible for you to make. And I love Ralph too, what you said about life is like what an exploding train wreck of was it infinite possibility. I think something like that. Yes. And I think that's what awaits you from that. So thank you so much for listening. And Ralph, thank you for being a guest on the School for Good Living podcast. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the School for Good Living podcast. Before you take off, I just want to extend an invitation to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life still isn't working for many people. Whether it's here in the developed world where we deal with depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, divorce, unfulfilling jobs or relationships that don't work, or in the developing world where so many people still don't have access to basic things like clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or they live in conflict zones, there are a lot of people on this planet that life isn't working very well for. 
If you're one of those people, or even if your life is working, but you have the sense that it could work better, consider signing up for the School for Good Living's Transformational Coaching Program. It's something I've designed to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated, or you've gone through a divorce, or you've gotten married, headed into retirement, starting a business, been married for a long time, whatever. No matter where you are in life, this nine-month program will give you the opportunity to go deep in every area of your life, to explore life's big questions, to create answers for yourself in a community of other growth-minded individuals. And it can help you get clarity and be accountable to realize more of your unrealized potential. It can also help you find and maintain motivation. In short, it's designed to help you live with greater health, happiness, and meaning so that you can be, do, have, and give more. Visit goodliving.com to learn more or to sign up today.